leading it. So um, today we have two exciting, a current and a former student. Uh, they, it's really nice to have our our own um, uh, present at these meetings. And I just wanted to say that Devin graduated just last year, and and she um, found this particular job with EcoLogic. Um, because of other students who had done internships. So my call out here is that if you are doing, if you're looking for an internship or a job, you should come to our internship symposium in the spring and learn about what other students are doing because you never know where it will lead you. So um, that's my call out to sort of creating a community around trying to learn what other students are doing. Um, Ecologic is a is an organization based right here in Cambridge and they do a lot of international work trying to sort of, especially with, I think, what you would call disadvantaged communities who who are trying to sort of do things in a more sustainable fashion. And Annalise Stratton, our second speaker, is actually working my lab this, this year as a, doing an honors thesis in environmental studies. She was able to do a summer scholar. She went to uh, Guatemala last summer, did some work in the community there. And now she's coming back and analyzing some of those results. So we're going to hear both about the face of Ecologic, and we're going to learn about some of the, some of the projects that they were able to sort of support by getting our students involved. So it's really exciting to have them come and talk about Ecologic. So welcome back and welcome. So you know how you do this? Great. Okay. Is there any other technology that I need to be aware of? The clicker. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm Devin Powell. Um, I'm the Communications Officer for Ecologic Development Fund, and like Colin said, I graduated from Tufts, what feels like 10 minutes ago. Um, and my colleague Dave is also here. I forgot to take his name off the presentation, but he's not presenting. Don't worry. I'm not going to put you on the spot. So, um, our Ecologic was founded in 1993, and our mission is to empower rural and indigenous peoples to restore and protect tropical ecosystems in Central America and Mexico. Um, and it's important to note that we do so in a way that is, is economically and socially empowering, and that we only go into communities where we've been asked to work. Um, we believe that, that truly sustainable conservation work takes into account social and economic needs, as well as environmental. So this is a map of where we work across Central America and Southern Mexico, the region that's known together as Mesoamerica. Uh, as you can see, we have two projects in Mexico, three in Guatemala, two in Honduras, one in Panama, and then one project that's a binational project in Belize and Guatemala. Um, and why, why this region? Why Mesoamerica? Um, it's a region that's incredibly rich in biodiversity. It's the thread that connects the continents of North and South America. It's an important corridor for, for the passage of species and genes, but it's also a region that's rife with a lot of poverty and inequality. So it's a place that has a lot of opportunities for us to do our work. So when we, when we talk about our mission, the work that we do is, is underlied by these four core values of that we call selectivity, Solidarity, co-design, and connection. And you, you know, you can see what they are up here, but the selectivity is that when we're basically when we're planning a project, that we I mean, well, first of all, when we're asked by communities, this is how we, we start we start projects when we are asked by communities to go into a place. Um, but that when we're planning a new project, we place we place a premium on looking at places that are underserved, but that we feel have very rich untapped resources and where a culture of conservation will be able to flourish. Um, Solidarity, this formation of long-term partnerships with local organizations is a key tenet of our work. We don't just, just go in and run projects ourselves, but every project that we do is done in conjunction with a local partner organization that's based on the ground, that has roots in that community, and that has a lived awareness of the needs and interests of that place. Um, Co-design, at every, every step of, of the planning and operations of our projects, Community members are involved in decision making every step of the way. We don't go in and dictate the way that something should be, but we listen to the needs of communities and we alter our plans depending on what they want. Everything that we do is a participatory, equal partnership based process. And then finally, connection. Um, in order to make all of our projects as sustainable as possible, we try to bring together stakeholders from a bunch of different sectors. Um, we forge connections between the people who use natural resources 
between local governments, between organizations, between programs, to make sure that all of our projects are beneficial and sustainable in the best way possible. So to bring that down to specifics, these are some of the tools that we use when we're doing our work in the region. Um, and this is not an exhaustive list. And again, we, we tailor the particulars of the work that we do depending on the needs um, and interests of a place. But these are some, some of the core programs that we do almost in all of the places that we work. Um, education is a key tenant of all the work that we do. Um, and a lot of that involves peer-to-peer -peer learning and workshops. Um, learning exchanges are something particularly cool that we do where, for example, we will connect a project or organization that's in the earlier stages with another group that's been successful at achieving similar goals so that folks can learn from each other and not just from us. Um, watershed management is important to our work. Water is necessary to, to all life, human and otherwise. Um, and so for us, it includes a whole host of activities including reforestation, which is stops erosion, uh, waste cleanup, more education programs, and we also work to support and strengthen local governance institutions that help manage these resources responsibly. Payment for environmental services, um, for anyone who's not familiar with the concept, is at its most basic a system where users of a natural resource are provided with some sort of incentive to steward that resource. Um, and for us, that takes some different forms. For example, in Honduras, we developed a project where um, members of a community pay a small fee to their local community water council and also donate time as volunteers to conservation work and watershed restoration. And in exchange, that ensures that they get clean water piped into their homes and also ensures a healthy ecosystem. Um, on another vein, in Mexico, in Chiapas, we're working with Mayan communities to connect them with the United Nations Red Plus program. Um, which would allow them to sell carbon credits on the international market, which will contribute to global efforts to mitigate climate change and also provide these local communities with a financial incentive to conserve the rainforest that they live in. And then finally, agroforestry is something that Annalise is going to go into much more detail about when she talks, um, but it's basically uh, an agricultural technique where you plant certain types of trees alongside crops, and that helps restore soil quality and prevent erosion. And agroforestry and other sustainable agriculture techniques are particularly important to note because in this region, crops are traditionally grown using flash and burn agriculture, um, which is destructive to the environment, is a huge driver of deforestation, and also greatly reduces soil quality. So the, up there is a picture of some folks in Honduras at our project area with a clean water tank. And then the second picture is a guy, sort of hard to see with the light, but he's standing in his agroforestry plot. So, and then, you know, we've been around for 21 years now, and we've worked with more than 600 communities, held a lot of workshops, planted well over a million trees, built a lot of fuel-efficient stoves, gotten 300 farmers to, to work on agroforestry, um, preserved a lot of land, and helped establish local water committees like what I was talking about in about 160 communities. And, of course, much more to come. So before I hand the reins over to Annalise, Colin did mention this, but we will be looking for interns for the spring and eventually for the summer, both in our office, which is right in Harvard Square, and also potentially in the field to do projects like what Annalise did this past summer. So if you want to learn more about that, come and talk to me at any point or we're online. So that's it, all you. Good. Okay, well, while he's getting that set up, um, I, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Annalise Stratton. I'm a biology and environmental studies senior this year at Tufts. Um, and this project uh, was done through Summer Scholars funding. I basically got funding through Summer Scholars um, and then coordinated with Ecologic to be an intern in the field with them. Um, so just a shout out to Summer Scholars as well uh, before I get started. So, oh, thank you. This is very weird with the headphone thing. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so to start off, um, what does this first line mean? Basically, I started off with that because it's one of the few Kekchi Mayan phrases that I actually remembered and learned from the field. Um, and it means the path is very muddy. And so just starting off with that, to 
kind of, I guess, give a shout out to field work uh, in general, that I came into the system not having a ton of kind of information um, about what I was getting myself into, but um, planned as much as I could beforehand. But then once you get into the field, as much as, as you can plan beforehand, you really um, have to do some improvisation and learn from both what the people in the field are telling you, but also um, the environmental factors that you notice while you're there. Uh, so um, my presentation is going to be two parts, basically. The first part is going to be talking about what field work was actually like, what I learned while I was there, and then the input that I gave to Appersar Stoon, which is the local partner that Ecologic works with in this region, um, which is the Sarstoon region right on the border between Belize and Guatemala. I was in the Guatemala side. Uh, it's a tropical lowland region. But anyway, so I, the first part of the presentation is going to involve talking about the field work itself. The second half will be talking about what I actually did with the data I collected while I was there, um, which is going toward a senior thesis. So before I set out, these were my broad objectives for what I actually wanted to accomplish while I was there. Um, first of all, I wanted to know what classes of maize were actually being grown in the region. Um, all of this was coming in with a, a frame of mind of not only planning for a senior thesis, but also thinking about what could be useful to Ecologic and to Aperser Stoon um, that, I guess, so it would serve two purposes. Um, so first of all, what are the local maize land races, maize being corn, uh, which is the main food consumed by all of the people in this region through tortillas. Um, and once I understand what corn is available, I wanted to understand how that corn passes around between the different villages I was working in. So what are the distribution patterns? How do people get the corn that they're planting? Um, and whether they exchange with each other. Um, thirdly, I was interested in climate. So um, interested in whether certain climatic effects on crops, if there were any climatic effects, um, could be influenced by those exchanges between um, basically thinking about seed genetic diversity and whether uh, that could, I guess, be thought of in a way that could influence um, the effects on the crops themselves. If there's more genetic diversity through all of this exchange, um, potentially the um, climatic changes could have less influence on the crops. Sorry, that was a little confusing. Uh, and then basically, after I understood all of those changes, um, I was interested in seeing how could I report this back to Appersar Stoon, which is the local partner, again, and Ecologic, and see if they could actually make changes to the program um, based on those results. So how did I plan to get these results? Firstly, I went and did 60 interviews um, with Kekchi Mayan farmers in the region. The interviews were in Spanish or in Mayan Kekchi translated through um, members of Appersar Stoon, who took me around to the different villages while I was there. Um, collecting maize grains for a later analysis, which I've been doing this semester, and will continue into next semester for my thesis, um, and taking lots of field notes, photographs, um, and also measuring the corn. So while I was in the field, these are the initial results, um, I guess, or what I did uh, with the help of Aversar Stoon. I visited 11 villages, conducted 60 interviews, um, measured a lot of corn cobs, and um, collected a lot of seeds. So once I actually did all of that, I had to think about what I was getting out of it. Um, who was I interviewing? Basically, 60 farmers, average age of 44 years. Um, they had a lot of children, generally. Uh, an interesting thing to note, even though the average number of children um, of the farmers I interviewed was six, some farmers had as many as 12 children, others had one. Um, and this varied like very extremely by whether or not farmers were educated. I interviewed a couple of college-educated farmers or high school-educated farmers, and they generally had one to two children, um, whereas a lot of the uneducated farmers had 10 to 12 children. So that's why um, it averaged out to six, but in general, it was pretty extreme either direction. Um, and then generally, farmers were not very well educated um, in terms of formal schooling, formal schooling, in which they generally had two years. A lot of them didn't have even one year of school. Um, and these are the villages in which I did interviews. And I mostly interviewed men, um, just because men do the majority of the farming in this region. Um, so in answer to my first question about um, my goals for my research while I was in the field, what are the varieties of corn in the region? 
these are the farmer identified classes that were in the SARS student region, five different classes, um, white and red husked white, they made a distinction between them and said one was better for pest resistance than the other, which was the red husked white, um, and then black corn, which looks kind of purple, red and yellow corn. Um, and what's the difference between the classes? Overall, farmers said there really isn't a big difference in terms of how this tastes, um, which I was like, darn, I hope there's a big difference and I could, you know, test all of these things about it. But basically, overall, they said they cultivated them in mostly the same way. They tasted and ate them in mostly the same way, um, except that white corn was by far the most prevalent, um, and that was because it was more marketable. They could sell it to their neighbors. They could sell it to the local town, whereas all of the other varieties were only for household consumption. Um, and then yellow corn, people generally said they fed to their animals, potentially higher in protein, um, and the other varieties were just for household consumption. Few farmers used improved seeds, improved being um, generally hybridized seeds that were given to them by um, a government program or an NGO. So a lot of those programs had not yet come into this region or farmers couldn't afford to buy um, improved seeds. So pretty much all of the seeds that were grown were native varieties, um, according to the farmers themselves. And there was a lot of cross-pollination, as you can see, um, resulting in this sort of, I guess, speckled pattern of corn. Um, and these are the actual land races of corn um, in this region. Uh, so the second question was distribution and exchange. Um, now that we know what, what corn farmers have, how are they getting it and um, are they exchanging it? It looks like 82% of farmers do exchange corn, at least in the sample that I did, um, which means that there's a lot of back and forth happening in terms of the genetics of the corn. I didn't do a lot of analysis into this yet, um, but I'm interested in whether that actually would um, enhance the genetic quality of the corn. Uh, and then there are a lot of factors that farmers look for in exchange. Basically, a lot of it's preferential, but some of it has to do with pest resistance or the size of the kernels, things like that. Um, and then I asked about climate change. So now that we know both what people are growing and how they're getting it, how are those crops or are they being affected by climate changes? Um, the climate change question was a very strong affirmative. People, 83% of the farmers I interviewed said there are climate changes happening in the region. Um, and, you know, this data isn't the most, uh, I guess I wouldn't use this in a scientific paper because it's very much based on their own perceptions and it's hard for people to think in, you know, scales of 20 to 30 years. But a lot of the older farmers I did ask said, yes, the weather patterns have gone through an extreme change recently. Um, they're becoming a lot more variable um, and it's becoming hotter and there are more extreme weather events. A lot of the things that you hear about climate change are also true in this smaller region. Um, and then the people who said that they hadn't noticed changes, uh, most of them said, oh yes, this year there are big changes. Um, and that was basically that in past years there was a dry season and a wet season, and this year it was very inconsistent and they didn't know what to expect weather-wise. Um, but I didn't count that in yes to climate change because it's only one year. Um, and so these are just some effects that farmers were noticing in their crops based on the climatic changes. Um, the specifics aren't so important, but basically, Corn is being affected at every step of the way. Um, so besides the objectives that I went into the study with, a lot of other factors came in. Um, when you go into a system, you have to think about um, not just your study question, but also all the other factors that could come in and influence uh, your results. So I came in thinking about climate change uh, and how that was affecting the corn, and then I realized there are a lot of other things that were complicating the story, um, including um, an already massive loss of parcel productivity, meaning the soil was just not having high production anymore in terms of corn in the region before it got there, um, as well as a lot of herbicide use and some interesting findings with agroforestry. So quickly, um, this is very sad. Most farmers I talked to said, we have really horrendous yield. We used to have yield that was at least twice as much. Um, you know, within the span of five years ago, and the soil quality is really degrading. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that there's a lot of deforestation happening. This relates a lot to the project that Ecologic is doing in the region, which is primarily reforestation project. Um, 
at least through Appersar Stoon, and so they're working a lot on these issues, and agroforestry is one of their main techniques, but um, deforestation is still a big issue. People are slashing and burning forests, and there are more people because they're having 10 to 12 children, and um, there's a lot of use of herbicides, um, which is problematic on, on these soils that are already heavily eroded, um, further degrees the soil quality, and then people are reusing a lot of land because they're losing a lot of land. Um, there are massive plantations coming in and kind, kind of buying out parcels of theoretically unclaimed land that communities are living on but te don't technically have the deed to. Um, and so this is causing them to be sort of fragmented, um, which uh, means that they're using the same parcels over and over again. And that, of course, degrades land quality since they aren't using synthetic fertilizers generally. Um, and then this is another big issue, um, which is related to the loss of parcel productivity. Um, Tunoso is this giant aggressive grass. This is a cornfield. I'm sure you can't tell. Um, but it's probably only been empty for like a year, I would say, or less, maybe even a few months. Um, but this is in one of the villages in which I was interviewing. And basically the issue that people are having is herbicide resistance. They started applying herbicides. Before that, they were using machetes to chop down um, the weeds in their fields. Um, and now they switched over to herbicides, and the weeds are basically becoming resistant and taking over the fields, and they have to apply, of course, more and more. It's a positive feedback cycle that's um, causing a lot of issues and further depleting the soil. And that's something many farmers talk to me about. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the herbicide use, which has a lot of other implications um, for health, since many of them don't wear proper protective gear, or none of them wear proper protective gear, I should better say. Um, but basically, it affects soil fertility. Um, it's also a big issue in terms of um, a cover crop, which is beneficial for soil fertility that has traditionally been present in these fields, and I'll talk about more in a second. But basically, with herbicide, those cover crops can't regrow because um, they normally would self-regenerate um, after the fallow sort of cycle. Um, but because of the herbicides, they're no longer able to do that, and so a lot of farmers are losing this one beneficial cover crop that was adding nitrogen to the soil and improving their yields. Um, and then it's also very toxic. So this is just one quote. Um, you don't have to read the whole thing, but basically uh, this is one of the men I was working with, Jose Domingo Cal, and um, this is an anecdote about how every day when he was you know, in elementary school, he would have to go out after school and apply herbicides, and a lot of times you know, the containers that they had were really inadequate, and the stuff would just pour on them. Um, and he thinks he has headaches now because of it. This is something that you know the CDC in the U.S. has like unrestricted access because people need to know how to apply it without hurting themselves. And unfortunately, that's not the case because a lot of times they were just distributed the equipment and didn't get information about how to be safe with it. Um, so what is this? This is guama. Um, there was, there's wild guama in the area. Guama is an agroforestry crop, the one that Ecologic uses primarily to intercrop with um, maize and other primary crops. Um, in this region, uh, basically it's a nitrogen fixing plant that will rejuvenate the soil while also providing firewood and things like that. It's actually, there are a lot of local ones that grow in their fields. Um, this is a guama, guama grove that was organized by Ecologic. Um, so as I was going around to all these sites, I was noticing um, that they aren't actually intercropping with corn, um, which was un unexpected uh, because that is one of the primary goals of agroforestry is to intercrop with corn so that you can grow the plant, um, get firewood from these um, trees while also growing your you know, corn that you want to eat every year. Unfortunately, people were having really bad luck getting good harvests of corn planting with the um, guama species. So they had stopped intercropping and were just using it for firewood. Um, so that's something that I reported back at the end, thinking about maybe improving techniques so that they actually get good yields. Um, or, and then they're also very tasty seeds of this crop. Um, or um, using this, which is mucuna, frijolabono. So it's like fertilizer bean. <clears throat> Basically, is an alternative, at least as I viewed it, or a supplement to intercropping with um, with guama because it is another nitrogen-fixing plant. It's one that the locals are used to. 
um, that, as I said, used to grow in their fields and now they're losing a lot of their seeds because of herbicides. But basically it's beneficial because um, it fixes nitrogen, suppresses weeds, it'll basically take over a fallow field after they've harvested the corn um, and rejuvenate the soil before the next planting. Um, and then that prevents a lot of erosion because the soil is covered. Um, and this is something that I, in the end, recommended for Apple Star Stone to invest more in. They already have one nursery for these plants and they're distributing seeds to other villages, but I think um, it would be a good idea to emphasize mukuna, um, at least for short-term short benefits, because it can improve yield really rapidly, um, rather than focusing all efforts on agroforestry with guama, which hasn't had good results in this region. Um, so that's the first part of my presentation. And then moving on to the second part, this is another of my coworkers from Appersar Stoon, and when I was thinking about how I wanted to analyze all this data at the end of my field period, I asked him, you know, what do you think would be most interesting to you as Upper Star Stoon? Um, thinking kind of about that co-design aspect that Devin mentioned, um, I was trying to go for a similar idea um, in asking him, what can I do with this data that will be beneficial to you as well as help my thesis? Um, and he said, basically, think about first what varieties of corn you have, then think about um, oops. Then think about whether those varieties are being affected by climate change um, and how the quality is already being affected by other issues. And then you should think about cropping system and how that plays a role in um, the quality of the corn. And so that's what I ended up doing. Moving forward, um, this is my primary thesis question. Uh, I'm basically interested, there is, it's a two-part thesis. The first part is looking at data from all these corn seeds I collected, thinking about nutrition and how that's affected by environmental factors. And um, then the second aspect is much more qualitative, looking into the interviews and thinking about how the Kekchimaya and these villages perceive health both in the ecosystem and for themselves, and relating that back to the data that I got in the first part. Um, and my three methods are um, nitrogen and amino acid content assays, so that's thinking about protein um, and how protein is affected by these factors, looking at the interviews, and then doing statistical tests on those results. Um, so this is sort of the core of my research question. I'm interested in the connections between the field um, to post-harvest, to actual cooking the tortilla, what is the quality of that corn that you're eating? So the factors I'm looking at are the biodiversity of the field. These are um, you know, questions that I asked within my interviews of farmers. What kinds of other crops are you, are you growing? Um, other inputs to your system like herbicides, whether you have um, a cover crop or not, things like that, and whether you own your land or whether you're renting your land, that also obviously impacts the corn quality um, because they're not gonna take good care of land that they're just renting from someone. Um, they probably won't have mukuna on it, things like that. Um, so all these factors can definitely influence, or at least my hypothesis is that they can influence the quality of the corn that people are eating um, based on the quality of the soil. And then at the second stage, after the corn is harvested and leaves the field, um, are farmers exchanging it? Is that genetic diversity playing a role in the quality of the corn? Um, is it being eaten? <laughs> Herbivory is, you know, are insects coming and consuming part of your corn? That's probably going to affect at least the amount of food you're getting, if not the quality of that food. Um, and then are people producing this food for market or is it just going to their home? Um, and this is the stage that I'm in. Um, so in order to analyze the seeds and test for all of these quality questions, um, I have, I've done a lime treatment, which is a traditional, it's called nixtamalization. And basically what it is is um, cooking the seeds in a calcium hydroxide solution, which is basically like ash that you could just get from your fire. What they do is they take ash from their fire, they boil the seeds in that ash, and it actually improves the protein profile of the corn that they're eating. Um, and then they grind that soaked corn and cook it into tortillas. Um, and that's the process that they go through every day when they're cooking their tortillas um, with fresh corn from their fields. Um, and so I did that, and I guess, processing step before I did my analyses, which I thought was important. Um, and then I'm also looking at the protein concentration and how it's affected by all these factors, and um, overall the nutritional quality, thinking mostly about amino acid profile within that protein. Um, so uh, just breaking down the different factors, I'll go through this quickly. Um, 
One is the biodiversity, thinking about monoculture versus <clears throat> um, polyculture. So are people planting just maize or are people planting maize with their beans and their yams and you know all of the other crops that they're growing um, and whether that affects the quality. Um, medicinal plants, I just use this as a metric for um, basically what weeds could come up that could be useful within a field, just asking people, have you noticed a change in the amount of weeds um, that are useful, that are edible or medicinal? Um, and most people said generally that, um, unfortunately, there are a lot fewer medicinal plants growing in their fields because of the herbicides, obviously, which are killing those plants specifically um, and letting the grasses grow <clears throat> because they're a little more aggressive. Um, and then, uh, what other crops do they have, just sort of as another metric. Um, thinking about exchange, I'm just touching on a few of the different topics. I'm going to be looking at a lot of different factors for each of these um, when I do my analyses. But um, looking at exchange, are farmers exchanging corn? If so, how often per year? Um, and does that affect the quality? Um, does it matter what specific qualities they're looking for? This is all about seed selection. Um, and then herbivory, this was another unexpected thing. Um, basically, some of the seeds that I collected were already infested with um, this maize weevil, and so I was interested in how that was affecting the quality of the corn. Uh, it turns out sometimes people who are really um, hard hit for food will actually eat corn that's been infested because this is the manner of storage. This is actually a good example of how they store the corn after they harvest it. Yes, all these environmental factors are playing a role um, in you know the quality of the corn, but right after it's harvested, a lot of other things come into play um, because basically they're letting it sit in the open air um, until they eat it. And sometimes it's well organized like this, um, which is a good example, but still obviously prone to getting eaten by insects. Um, or it's just in a pile on their floor or out in the field, um, usually inside some structure. But Basically, uh, most farmers have an issue with these insects, and so I was interested to see in how that affected the quality of the corn, um, and I actually have some initial results about this that I'll talk about momentarily. Um, so going back to that interview, in my actual processing of this information, um, these are basically the steps that I wanted to go through, thinking about how he had told me this would be the most beneficial for us. Um, so first, I want to think about what classes of maize. Secondly, what's the quality of that maize? And that's using the protein. Um, and then is climate change a factor? And then how do we adapt based on all of this information, um, perhaps the way we grow our corn or whether we're using mucuna, things like that. Um, and so my principal analyses for, I guess, in order to get to that point um, are two. The first one is, Protein and amino acid, this is like laboratory assays, basically. Um, testing the corn, looking at the nitrogen content, which is uh, proportional to the protein content of the corn. That's sort of a total protein metric. And then I'm also going to go more in depth and think about amino acids, which are the building blocks for proteins. Um, and since corn is usually deficient in two of the like eight essential amino acids, and this uh, nixtamalization actually improves those two, I'm interested in what are the proportions of those two amino acids that usually are lacking in the different varieties of corn and also in the different environmental factors? Um, so I'm looking at protein, amino acids, and thinking about those classes of maize and the maize quality, those big ideas. Um, and then for the other half of it, of the climate change question, because that's pretty hard to measure just on farmer perceptions, it's a much more qualitative analysis. Um, so I'm thinking about how those climate change effects um, influence the health of the ecosystem, not just you know the organisms that live there, but also the people, thinking of that a little bit more holistically. Um, and then how do we adapt based on that quantitative information as well as the qualitative um, interview information? And I have some initial results, um, which is exciting. I actually just got these this week. Um, so I did the protein um, assay. Uh, the past couple of weeks, and I had a significant result, which was exciting. So um, just using the white corn that I collected from the field, uh, I compared between farmers who had mucuna and farmers who didn't, based on the interviews, um, whether they had mucuna in their fields. The way that mucuna works is they basically plant it or it comes up if they don't use herbicides. Um, 
in the like second half of their dry season planting or uh, growing period for maize. And then once they harvest the corn, which is already tall enough at that point that it won't compete, um, they just let the mukuna take over the field. And that's how it suppresses the weeds, and that's how it prevents erosion, and that's how it rejuvenates the soil. And then they have a short fallow period, and then they'll chop down all of that mukuna, which is a lot easier to chop down than, um, you know, something like those grasses that we saw earlier. Um, and they'll replant the next cycle or burn it, um, <laughs> which is another <laughs> issue um, that I didn't go into in great depth, but um, also greatly affects soil quality. Um, so basically, mukuna is important because it actually translates to the human protein that we're ingesting when we eat the corn. It's not just affecting the quality of the ecosystem. It's not just affecting, oh, you know, these are healthier plants because there's more nitrogen in the soil because these mukuna plants fixed it. It's also affecting the actual quality of the corn that people are eating that grows out of this field. Um, so fields that had mukuna produced corn with higher protein content which I thought was very interesting. Um, my other metrics that I just did this semester, this is sort of an introduction to my thesis, I would say. Um, I'm doing a Bio 193 course and analyzing some of the data. Um, the biodiversity factors that I looked at were unfortunately not, um, not, not unfortunately, didn't show any signs through the protein content, at least, um, of having an influence on the quality of the corn. Um, so while, Biodiversity is very beneficial, at least in the metrics that I looked at. This is um, thinking about, uh, okay, this one is, uh, it's, sorry, I didn't put the title on here. Um, how many classes of corn that farmers are growing as a metric for biodiversity? So while I was only testing the protein quality of the white corn, in this instance, I was looking at, are farmers growing four different varieties of corn together, or are they just growing their one white variety of corn? Um, and that did not play um, into the protein content. Although you can still see in this graph, um, the ones without mukuna are still lower than the ones with mukuna. So that was shown through all of the different metrics that I looked at um, in terms of protein quality. So um, then the other factor that I looked at in this initial um, part of the study was mono versus poly polycropping. So what I talked about earlier, whether um, the corn is being grown with all of the other crops that they're growing or whether it's just being monocrops. There's just corn in the field while it's growing. Uh, and this also didn't have a significant impact um, on the protein content, but I'm sure that it also influences a lot of other things um, within the ecosystem and ecosystem health, therefore. Um, so I also looked at herbivory, which I mentioned, and it turns out it doesn't actually influence the um, quality of the corn. It may influence the content of protein that's there since they're eating it, but um, it doesn't influence the actual protein concentration. So that's basically saying they'll just eat anything. They won't seek out the protein and eat that first within the seed. Um, and where am I going from here? Um, so I just finished the first round of analyses, and next semester I'm going more intensively into the interview analysis and also doing the amino acids. Um, I'll have my thesis ready by April. Um, if you all want to come to my defense, uh, this is the precursor. So thank you very much for coming, and thanks to everyone else who helped me get here. Um, yeah, that's all. How we do this now? I'm analyzing. Oh, oh, sure. Okay. Uh, the question was the question was um, at what stage in the corn processing process uh, corn processing process um, in corn processing uh, am I sort of stopping at to do the analysis because I'm obviously not making tortillas. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't give them to you to eat though. Some of them have been invested, um, but uh, yeah. So basically. 
basically I did, the corn was already dry relatively. They'll dry it sometimes in the sun, um, usually on the stalk, um, or they'll just kind of take it and it'll naturally be pretty dry at that point because it's not like sweet corn, it's not soft kernels, they're already hardened. Um, so I got through that process automatically, kind of drying the corn, and then I did this nixtamalization. And then what I did was, after nixtamalizing, I dried it again and am analyzing those samples. So it's different from how they would do it because instead of drying the corn, they immediately grind it and make that into tortillas. So I added one other step in. Um, and I didn't heat it when I dried the corn, so it shouldn't affect the quality. Um, that's the step. Uh, sure. Uh, so the question is, do weevils usually attack just post-harvest or also in the field? And these insects just attack after they've been harvested. Um, there are a lot of other, like, worms and things that will infest the corn in the field, but aren't as much of an issue. And I think that's a lot of, a lot, I think that's mostly due to the fact that a lot of them are growing in polyculture. Um, they don't have to use as many pesticides. A couple of farmers do use pesticides, but that's an important distinction. I'm not talking about pesticides when I'm talking about, you know, the agrochemicals that they're using. They're almost exclusively using herbicides, and that's because they don't have as many issues in the field. Ooh, that's interesting. I haven't looked at that yet. So I have so many things that I'm interested in looking at. Um, for this first part of the analysis, I just took a couple of factors, kind of a smattering to get an idea. Um, but I will definitely look into that because that's a really interesting question. Um, yeah. I think you had your hand up first. Yeah. So I think a lot of the difference, oh, the question was, um, are a lot of people growing in polyculture or is it mostly monoculture? And how do I think, I guess, that affects the system or just, yeah. Um, so my answer to that would be most of the farmers I talk to probably grow in polyculture, except a lot of them aren't growing other crops. Um, and that a lot of that has to do with time. If um, So basically, people were usually growing in polyculture unless they weren't growing other crops. So then it was obviously monoculture. Um, and a lot of that had to do with time. Um, a lot of farmers I talk to, while they are still subsistence farmers, um, they are also working on the side. And a lot of that is in villages that have lost a lot of their land to plantations. Many of the farmers no longer have land, uh, enough land to grow all of their food. And so they have to buy corn from other farmers. Um, and those farmers go and work in the plantations to make that money. And so they don't have a lot of time to farm their own plot. And so they'll just grow one variety of corn, usually the white corn. Um, but I would say maybe a third of people um, just grew corn by itself and planted their other crops like near the house or separate. Um, but a lot of them did. Like the tradition is to plant in polyculture in the region. If you had a question. A lot of that depends on quantity. So the question is, are farmers <clears throat> selecting um, their seeds for quality? And the answer is definitely yes. Like farmers will, if they have the option, choose the seeds that are usually bigger. A lot of those, I had that slide about seed selection. I asked them, you know, like what seeds are you picking to plant for next year? Or if you're doing a trade, do you look for certain kinds? Um, and yes, they did look for certain uh, aspects. I don't know if yet if that had an impact on either the quality or the um, quantity of corn that they got out of those seeds. Uh, this is really far back. Um, but uh, anyway, I think I'll not do that. But um, I would also say that um, it was very quality determined, not quality determined, um, quantity determined. So if farmers actually didn't have that many, you know, if they had pretty low production, because a lot of these farmers are getting like really, really low production because the soil is so poor, They'll just eat all of the corn that they can, and then whatever's left they'll plant. Or they'll, you know, exchange with their neighbors, and a lot of times is just getting corn from their neighbors when they don't have any left to plant, and then giving some next season when their other, 
you know, when their friend doesn't have any left to plant. Um, so I guess they will select if they have the option. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in who are the funders. I'm also interested in how something gets sustained after additional funding. In other words, does your local, does the local organization have a separate source of money in order to keep themselves going? I'm just I just sort of imagine what has kept this in business for 21 years and what has allowed it to sort of grow beyond immediate impact. Well, um, that was a long question, but the question to summarize was about how we get our funding and how our local partners get their funding and what is our general business model. Um, and Dave, if you want to jump in on this at any point, feel free. Um, but to, to summarize, I mean, most of our the majority of our overall funding comes from institutions, comes from foundations, um, and we request grants for particular projects. Um, and then some of our local partners are involved in fundraising on their own as well. Um, but you probably have more to say about that potentially than I do. Yeah? Yeah, introduce yourself real quickly. My name is Dave Kramer. I'm uh, the Senior Manager for Impact Learning and Innovation at Ecologic. Um, started at Ecologic about 10 years ago, uh, in school, uh, in school, and um, found a similar organization at that point on a terrible old website, but it looked cool to me that it was really a thing, but it was so exciting to find an organization with the mission at that time. It was slightly different than the one we have now, but the, the whole um, the way that the organization matches and, and kind of mixes the um, the need to to focus on the cultural aspects and the social aspects that are so essential to sustainable conservation uh, really grabbed me. And as well as our executive director now, who started as an intern at that around that time as well. Um, but uh, I guess to answer your question more directly, that I, I was a grant writer for about six years there, so I definitely had to explain this a bunch, but also um, see how our, our funding um, mix has almost traditionally, almost always been about 75% institutions and about 20% or so individuals, and then some corporate funding or corporate grant um, grant making. Um, but the, the idea of how do we actually create sustainable um, partnerships or allow an organization like Apple or Stoon to be um, stand on its own two legs in the future is a, is a key one to our mission. How are we actually creating sustainability and not dependency? And um, Apple or Stoon is a really interesting case of an organization that there, there was no local organization that local people felt was capable of representing their interests. And people like Jose Domingo Cal that, uh, that uh, um, Annalise showed who had poured the pesticide down or the herbicide down his back um, right there next to Annalise to the right of her um, to her left but um, he is uh, he was a, a graduate of an organization a school called Acten Amit which is a, a Mayan uh, boarding school and youth from all over the region attend that school and Annalise lived on their campus for a good chunk of her time there um, and they worked with us and our field staff to basically launch an organization and to take Upper Sarstoon from an idea to now an organization that represents 16 or so communities in the area and is really focused on, as, as she mentioned, as Annalise mentioned, there's a real problem with land tenure and lack of, lack of land tenure. So making sure people can advocate for themselves is a real big part of the equation as well. I can go on for hours, but I don't want to take on too much. Sure. So the question is, do we go back to communities that, whom we worked with previously and see how they are, how they're doing now? Um, I would say we we do that in a um, in a haphazard way, not a real systematic uh, approach. But a lot of the communities we work with now, we've worked with for over ten years, and in some cases longer. So with those, yeah, we have an institutional memory and, and we are, it's just part of our process. And we don't necessarily have an exit strategy, a lot of you know, business model and, and folks thinking about what's the best way to um, uh, be uh, an organization that doesn't create dependency. You have to have an exit strategy. That's not necessarily the case for us to say that we, we can just work with more and more communities and spread 
further and further out in, the, in this similar area is important. But um, in some cases, anecdotally, there's a the first place we ever worked is called Punta Manadique, Guatemala. And it's sort of, if you look on the map of Guatemala, where Guatemala juts out into the Caribbean, a little peninsula that's right on the border with Honduras in the eastern side of Guatemala. And that um, those communities uh, now are, I think they're the first I'm not mistaken, they're the first fishing communities that have launched, that have uh, created seasonal closure areas. So kind of like we're trying to do in, with fish up in this part of the world. Um, there's a voluntary seasonal closures and voluntary catch um, uh, limits and things like that, but it's all community driven. And they have at least been able on an environmental side, the environmental side of things, done a good job there of sustaining the work that we first started with, but it hasn't been just us. A lot of other organizations have worked with them too. So we try to stay humble in that sense because we're definitely not like long sold anywhere that we are. Okay, well, I would, um, the question is, does the type of wood ash affect the protein? Um, I would say, Probably not very much. Um, so the treatment that I did was calcium hydroxide, just calcium hydroxide. If, if they're actually using um, wood ash in these treatments um, in their own homes, it's going to be a lot less consistent, and there'll probably be a lot of you know little impurities, but mostly it's sodium calcium hydroxide that they're using. Um, traditionally, they use wood ash, but actually now a lot of them will buy bags of cow that are commercial. So it would be similar to what I used. Um, just calcium hydroxide pure. Um, so I don't know if it affects the quality, but uh, I don't have a way to test for that, unfortunately. Good question, though. So you went through the environmental studies program, and your second major was? IR. And so I'm just curious, what are some of the things, when you look back to your time at Tufts, that has prepared you most for what you're doing now? Gosh, that's a great question. You spoke into the microphones and I have to repeat it. Um, I mean, I, I previously worked for the Tufts Institute of the Environment, who has helped, helped sponsor these. So that was a huge piece of what prepared me for that. I was doing a lot of similar work with Ty as I do at Ecologic, um, communications, uh, social media, a lot of writing and design. Um, but my what I, what I studied between IR and environmental studies gave me a really great context for the kind of work that Ecologic does and made me very interested in it. Um, because what, what I was most interested in studying as an undergrad was sort of the, um, was, was looking at, at environmental programs and sustainability on a global scale and, and sustainability not just as a buzzword but as a concept that incorporates environmental health, economic well-being, and social well-being um, and how we in the global north can use the power and privilege that we have to do good on a global scale and, in the, and, and do good for the people and for the crucial environments of the global south. Um, and Ecologic is at our, you know, at a, at a somewhat small but but effective scale, working to address some of those questions. Um, so, yeah. Well, there are no further questions. I want to thank you again for coming. I wish you all success in finishing up the semester and have a good holiday break. And looking forward to seeing all of you um, back here in January. I'm sure you could come up and speak to the speakers individually for a few minutes afterwards. So thank you again. Let's give them another big hand.